episodes into what for me has been a bit of an epic adventure joining one motor racing legend to talk to other motor racing legends that previously featured on posters around my bedroom as a kid and I'm not ashamed to admit on my garage wall now I'm a bigger kid. Um, Guy, still plenty of stories left to unearth out there and you, you keep finding them in your little book of contacts. Yeah, well, I'm really lucky to, to you know, have driven with or uh, driven against or, or, or rubbed shoulders with some fantastic, uh, you know, people in the industry, whether it be drivers um, or uh, people that work behind the scenes. So, um, you know, now I'm getting on a bit, you know, I've met quite a few people and it's really great. Um, you know, the whole sort of idea behind this podcast was to kind of catch up with, with friends and talk a little bit about their career. And, um, you know, I was just saying to, to our guest, um, you know, a second ago, I've been learning about, about him because I've been reading about him. So I've learned a lot of things about him that I didn't already know. And uh, I'm really excited with, with today's guest. I think I've uh, got some great, you know, some great story, and a lot of history in the sport. And uh, also what a fantastic, uh, fantastic surname. So we're going to hear a little bit more about that uh, now. And another one of your teammates, but for once, I can say that I climbed into his race car before you did, but we'll come to that. Um, you're about to fly out to Le Mans to prepare for the big race, of course. We've managed to squeeze one more in, and there's even talk of you squeezing another one in, in between sim sessions and everything else. Um, you've got to do your rookie test, haven't you? Now, not rookie, but you, yeah, your rookie test. Well, it is a rookie test. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Le Mans rookie. Um, so... A Le Mans winner, but a Le Mans rookie. Yeah. So obviously, it's been, I think it's almost been 10 years, I think, since I last raced at Le Mans, so a long time ago. And um, while I know my way around, you know, you still have to go through this kind of process of, uh, of, of learning, you know, relearning the circuit. Um, I think it's more a case of proving that you know your way around. And obviously, we have all these slow zones now in, in the WEC and, and safety cars and things. So it's more a case of understanding those rules. And it's also a pretty good money-making exercise as well for the ACO, let, let's be honest. Um, so I've got that on Sunday. So I leave for Le Mans on Friday, um, simulator on Sunday, and then we're obviously on track later on in the week. Do you still Le get Mans, butterflies, Guy? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's starting to build now. I mean, you know, because of COVID, you're kind of always thinking, well, will it happen? No, it won't happen. It might happen. And, and even, even now, there's that certain element of that because of what's going on in the world. Um, at the moment we're going and it's starting to feel real now. So I'm starting to get my head in it. And certainly by, uh, you know, this time next week, we'll be, uh, well, this time next week, we'll be pretty much getting ready to get, to get on track. So looking forward to being back there. Um, I mean, you know, it's a challenge. It's always a challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a challenge that we, we enjoy doing. So it'll be fun. So, yeah, looking forward to it. And we'll, we'll make sure it's a bit of a Le Mans takeover on a spinning wheel social media as well. Um, today's guest comes from what can only be described as a, a motor racing dynasty. The Brabham name is synonymous with motorsport. You walk around any historic motorsport paddock now and there's a BT something somewhere in that paddock and usually quite a lot of them. But there's also a, a hypercar in the, in the concourse paddock these days, causing a bit of a stir with that uh, BT name on it as well. Um, it's on the track, though, on the racetrack, where the Brabham name really made its mark. And this man has driven pretty much everything, but it's probably safe to say that he's one of the most successful sports car races the world has ever seen. Um, David Brabham, welcome to Spinning Wheels. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Good, good. So I, I have, we have to start here. Where on earth do you start in motorsport with a three-time Formula One champion as a father? Well, first of all, thanks uh, for having me on the show. Um, and that's a really good question because a lot of people would assume that someone like myself with my father and my family uh, involved in racing for such a long period of time, you know, I'd be stuck in a go-kart and off I go at the age of four or five. Uh, the fact that I didn't even know people race go-karts at the age of 17 tells you how far removed I was from uh, this great sport. I was, I was actually being groomed to be a farmer. So I went to an agricultural boarding school uh, to learn all about agriculture. I left, I left school at 16 to work on the farm and then go to college to learn about wool. Uh, then I went to America to watch my brother race. Uh, and that was the first time really I, I saw racing proper and, and could absorb it. So you must have grown up with this immense pride that your dad was this superstar motor racing driver didn't you um you know when i when i was younger in australia my dad was like so famous really i mean everywhere i went everyone knew who jack was he was on tv doing ads uh you know he'd not long retired 
And to me, I was, you know, let's say I was seven, eight, nine years of age. I had a football in my, in my hands and my feet because I wanted to be a footballer. So I was always playing football. But I really didn't understand what all this was about, why people were, were looking at Jack as, as they were. And, of course, they would then look at me and then I'd feel, you know, about this big because it's like, why are they looking at me? Um, so it was a bit of a strange upbringing, I think, in that sense, because to me, dad, dad was dad. And, and, you know, I can remember walking past my dad's trophies, which are just incredible. And I only say incredible now, but when I was a kid, they were objects. They didn't really mean anything to me. I just walked past. Someone might be standing there looking at them. Someone who visited the house, you know, in absolute awe of what they're looking at. You know, Monaco Grand Prix winning trophy, 1959, you know, 1966 Constructors Championship, oh. like Dutch Grand Prix, British Grand Prix. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it was endless because he was so, so successful and so many trophies. And he kept a lot of his trophies. So uh, I would walk past and think, what's, what are they looking at? You know, because they were just like objects to me. But obviously, as I got older, I realized the significance yeah. of, of one, having a trophy yourself, but also what those particular trophies actually meant. Yeah. Do you almost wish that you, you'd been there during the time when he was racing or is that just not a thought process that's ever? Yeah, I do actually, because I actually think the sort of mid sixties, like pre wings yeah. was such a beautiful era for, for motorsport. I mean, yes, dangerous as hell. Yeah. People were dying and, and we can never forget that, but there was a romantic feel about it as well. Um, the Grand Prix film, for example. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. You know, and, and there was so much going on in the 60s. There was a massive change in the world and throughout the 10-year the period of the 60s. So, and motorsport saw so many changes throughout that time as well. Um, and I do, I do wish I was there to be able to absorb it more, but, you know, I have to, I have to look at old footage. And I, I was obviously fortunate enough to sit at a dinner table quite often with my dad and, and he would talk about those times. And of course, he was also, you know, not just not just a, an amazing driver, but you know, from a from a technical point of view, you know, with the with you know with his own cars and all the rest of it, there's so much more than than just being, you know, Jack, the kind of multiple world champion. There's, you know, it, there's so much more to to his story, which is which is amazing. And and obviously that that name lives on today, doesn't it? You know, through, through Grand Prix racing, and now obviously with the with, with the stuff that you're doing with the road car, um, it's such a such a strong brand. Um, you know, and I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing really what, what, what he's done. So, so with, with your racing then, David, so you, I mean, you said you didn't really start till 17. So, I mean, you're obviously very late. Um, was it just because you weren't really into the racing or was it just that you weren't really exposed to it or you didn't really know what was, what was going on? I think, I think both, you know, I didn't really have much interest. I didn't really have much exposure. I mean, you know, when I say didn't much have much interest, you know, dad would come back with some autosport magazines and yeah, I was actually quite interested in reading up on them. And I can remember the kind of, you know, the 80s, 70s and 80s magazines of autosport gave me some insight. Uh, and I never remember actually thinking, oh, I'm going to be a racing driver one day. That just, yeah. that just never really entered my head till I, I saw a go-kart for the first time. Uh, now, having said that, the, the sort of the need, in a sense, to, to push myself and go stupidly fast and sideways in any farm vehicle I could get my hands on or motorbike uh, was definitely in my DNA. Yeah, I mean, I did some absolute crazy stuff that I have no idea how I survived, why, why, why I'm sitting here now talking to you, because I got myself out of trouble so many times. But I think throughout that period, you know, I was kind of training myself to become a racing driver. I just didn't know it at the time. Yeah, yeah. So, so what, with the karting then, so how did you kart for before you went into car racing then? Was it kind of just, did you kind of go into cars fairly quickly or...? Well, I think I was probably going to come out of it within one race because I ended up on my roof uh, going over and over and over uh, in my first event. I ended up in hospital because well, back then, I mean, safety really wasn't really thought of. I just had a pair of jeans and a jumper and off I went racing. <laughs> so when I, when I ended up rolling over, and I've still got the scar on my back still today to show that very first uh, race weekend 
and uh, all my back was, all the skin was taken off my back. I ended up in hospital and they bandaged me up and I was like a mummy for, for about a week and then I had to go back. And then, you know, I'm laying there and, the, and, I, and they're looking at it and the doctor says, um, oh, can you take Betty down the, down the road? So my wife, uh, not my wife, my, my mum ended up, you know, being taken away. Then I hear, okay, hold him down. So all these nurses are holding me down and he's having to rip off these, this gauze that had gone into my skin because it was the wrong type of gauze that they were put on in the other hospital. So I'm absolutely screaming as this flesh is just being ripped off my back. You know what I mean? So I think my dad was going great. You know, he, he, he's not going to want to get back in a go-kart. That's for sure. So, uh, but I did. And I did about 18 months of go-karts. Yeah. Uh, I was still working on the farm, so I couldn't do it all the time. So my, my karting was somewhat limited. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I got in a go kart, when my, I mean, funny story, because Dad was n had no interest in me being a racing driver. I really? mean, he uh, absolutely none. So when I actually came back from America, uh, I sat down with him and I said, "Look, I, I, I want to have a go in a go kart." And he, you should. I mean, if I could just have a picture of his face, like he just literally was stunned. You know what I mean? But he wasn't particularly helpful, I would say. So I was lucky that I was uh, one working on the farm and actually earning a bit of money. Mm -hmm. I convinced my next door neighbor that we should go to a go-kart race, which was about three hours away, which was the local go-kart track. Yeah. Uh, we saw the racing go on for, wow. We put our money together, bought a secondhand go-kart, put the cart in the back of the ute. My dad was at the farm at the time. We strapped everything up and, and my mate, Terry and I were going to go off and do a day's testing, you know, and next thing, you know, my dad kind of knocks on the, on the window as I'm literally about to go and I wind the window down and he says, I better come with you. So he ended up traveling with us. And of course, during the day, I don't think he realized how mad I was behind the wheel on the, on the other farm vehicles, but you know, as soon as I got into a go-kart, I was fast and, and he was like, okay, where the hell did that come from? Because he just was not expecting it. Brilliant. Um, so that's kind of how it started. But I, I was about 18 months and then I was going to do another year of karting and then a opportunity came up to do a one make series, like it was called Ford Laces. Right, okay. Is that single, and, single seaters or? Oh, uh, no, they were, they were like Fiestas, like Ford Fiestas. Okay. Right, okay. Basically. Um, Mark Scaife, who you probably know down in Australia, he started in that championship when I started as well. And there were some really good, you know, sing, uh, let's say front wheel drive uh, specialists in there. Yeah. And that was my first year of racing in, in, in real, you know, other than karting in 1985. So uh, that, that's kind of, that was the first thing for me to, to get my teeth into. Yeah, yeah. And then what did you do after that? Did you kind of, did you, did you race in New Zealand as well? Did you do some stuff in New Zealand or was it all Australia? Or... Yeah, I did, I did um, a, a year of Formula Ford after that, 1600. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I was chosen to go to, um, to do the Tasman series and we we're going to take the Formula Ford. Yeah. Uh, and the team also had um, Formula Atlantic cars that they were going over. Yeah. And interesting enough my uh my wife's brother-in-law mike thackwell i don't know if I, know, I know all about mike thackwell because dave scott who my dad used to sponsor and i used to go to the races i mean obviously he was we, we all i don't know i don't know if paul knows the story but mike was just a sensational driver i mean like talk about he was like 19 i think he did he win the british f2 championship or he was oh, he won the european he won the european f2 championship he won the you know, european uh, yeah, and he was, I think he was 18 or 19 at the time. So like, and that was, yeah. and that was young, but you know, that time. Um, and, and he basically, yeah, he was, he was the, he was, the, he was the man. In fact, he was Palmer's teammate, Jonathan Palmer's teammate. Right. Yeah, in, in the Casio Rolf. That's right. Rolf's oh, wow. Team. You know, he's still got that car at uh, Palmer Sport. Oh, really? The boss, yeah. And, and then did he just retire? Yeah, yeah, he, uh, he did Formula 3000. He nearly won the championship with that. Um, and he then was driving also sports cars. 
got a deal with Mercedes, uh, and then and then actually I think driving up to a test at Paul Ricard, getting halfway up that hill. Yeah. Um, decided no, I don't want to do this anymore, and he turned around, and he went back home, and never saw a racetrack again, and he was 26. Really, really, yeah, just just amazing. Yeah, so he was going to be my teammate. Well, no, he wasn't going to be my teammate. I, he was going to be driving the, the Formula Atlantic car. Okay. But I was headed over there in the Formula Ford. Yeah. And then, and then the team asked me to do a test. Um, so I did a test at Oran Park in Australia in the Formula yeah. Atlantic car. And I think within 12 laps, I would have put a P3 on the, la the grid of the last race, right. like straight away. Um, and I came in and they said, okay, that's it. You're not going over there in the Formula Ford. You're gonna be Mike's teammate. You're gonna be driving for an Atlantic car. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was like, yeah, I'll, that, I, as soon as I got the Atlantic car, I thought, well, I don't wanna get back into Formula Ford. This no. thing was amazing, you know? So was, was, uh, but was but Kenny, also to be Mike's teammate. Kenny Smith doing it then, was he still? Oh yeah, yeah. Kenny Smith was looked old and, and had been around for years since, <laughs> You know, back then, I mean, he's how long ago now. is that? 30 years, 30 years ago. So he's still going, isn't he? Yeah, I think so. I think he is. Uh, he is amazing, that guy. I mean, oh, oh my God. I, yeah, I mean, he was, a, he was a great character. Very good driver. Um, shame that he never got to sort of spend more time in Europe or something yeah. racing. Yeah. He was certainly good enough. Uh, but, you know, New Zealand racing wouldn't be the same without a Kenny Smith. Yeah, yeah, and then you moved over to the UK, didn't you? Then did you did you did you, um, you move up? Did you get a scholarship or didn't you move over to, with the to do uh, a Vauxhall Lotus with the? Um, that was with Derek's team, wasn't it? With Justin Bell or Justin Bell racing? Yeah, yeah. But I yeah I I did a race uh, in Adelaide in eighty seven for the British Grand Prix. Uh, sorry, the Australian Grand Prix, and I and I qualified down the back and and won in fifteen laps and that was in front of the Formula One guys. And um, that really kind of put my name on the map a bit in Europe. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we, then my dad got and got a call to say, look, we're Camel was sponsoring sons of famous drivers. Okay. You know, here's an opportunity to go over and do Vauxhall Lotus in Derek Bell racing, racing with Justin. Yeah. Justin Bell. So uh, that was my ticket really to, to be able to go to to England and actually race. Um, Interesting. That's the first time that you, it seems that your dad's name has got you somewhere in the sport, which was contrary to what I expected. You know, that's the first time you've mentioned that, and until then, it was all you and him knocking on the window saying, "I'm coming." Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, to be fair to Dad, when I was karting and I, I, I showed him that I was one good enough to for him to go, "Well, okay, we can do something here." And to see that I actually had the commitment, you know, after a while, he said, okay, look, we, we better buy you a, go, a brand new go-kart, um, got a go-kart, you know, a, a friend of a friend kind of sponsored it and, and it kind of went on from there. And sure, dad's, dad's name helped everywhere I kind of went yeah. before I could establish myself, for yeah. sure. Um, I can't deny that. It, it, it's <laughs> just the way it was. So It's not a bad thing, is it? No, I mean, it's not. And, and it opened the door of an opportunity to, to come into Europe and, and race in the British Championship and the European form of Vauxhall Lotus, which was the first, the first year that that championship started. Yeah. Um, you know, with Mika Hakkinen and Alan McNish and uh, Peter Cox and, you know, some of the other guys there, Al Kaufman. Yeah, we you know we we were young, didn't quite know what we were doing. Although I had a bit more experience than the guys around me because of my former Atlantic stuff previously yes. and, and stuff in Australia, yeah. so I was I was a year or two older than. Um, and then um, uh, you know that I have to say I d I did the first half year and lost total motivation. Didn't like it. Uh, the cars were crap to yeah. drive. They were, they were terrible. Hard. They weren't, they weren't great, great. Um, and, and if you weren't cheating properly, you you just you just were nowhere. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking that actually, uh, I maybe I should go home because it just wasn't happening for me. And then uh, my dad and the owner of that team, although it wasn't Derek, it was another guy called Graham Burrows, who was a property developer. Because um, it was his money as well as Camel that kind of made all that happen. 
they got together uh, with Camel, and they and they we did a deal actually to race for Jack Brabham Racing in British in the British F3 Class B Championship. Right. Okay. Um, and and as soon as I got in that car, I just felt at home again. You know, um, and it was a good little team, and. I started halfway through the year. I won five of the last seven races and finished third in the championship. So it was it was enough for me to get noticed by Bowman, as you, we talked earlier about yep. um, the Juson car. Yeah, Juson Juson were sponsoring uh, Bowman Racing. Uh, uh, there was five of us that actually went to get the drive. We had to do a driving test, and we had to be interviewed by uh, the managing director at the time of Juson. Oh, really? And yeah. So, so explain the, the, the link. The reason we were talking about that is that this is why I, I jumped into a, a car alongside Derek Bell. Oh, sorry, some Derek Bell alongside David Brabham before guided. Um, I jumped in that Juicens car, didn't I? There's a picture of it on social media of me getting put in by my dad, who worked for Juicens at the time um, at Donington Park. That's that's really cool that that link exists for me. Yeah, that, yeah, no, it's 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 a small world, isn't it? Really is. Uh, so, so was and it, I think the, the interesting. Drive. Sorry, huh? was, that, was that a sponsored drive then? The juice that was a yeah, that was a fully sponsored drive. Um, so you know there was a lot at stake. Mm. Um, and when we did the interview with the MD, I knew I'd be okay in the driving because I had F three experience. I knew how to drive them. Uh, Rob Wilson was there as as kind of driver coach and and a, and a judge. And that I wasn't concerned about. I knew I could do a good job behind the wheel. Uh, but obviously sitting in front of the MD, I wasn't sure what was going to be said. And he only asked me one question, and that was, what's Juicen? Hmm. Now, at the time, when I just arrived in not long into the UK, uh, let's say a year, uh, I'd never been to a Juicen store, didn't know what Juicen was. But when they told me what the sponsor was, I said, well, give me some stuff on them. So they sent, they gave me some brochures on Juicen and I went into a store and had a look and went, oh, okay, now I've got it. And then when I got asked, I just, I wasn't sure what to say. And, and you know, when you kind of, you're a bit stuck to say, and then something from somewhere just comes, you know, yeah. and you've got to run with it. So I ran with it and it was, well, when I think of Juicen, I think of a home. And he just sat back like this and went, okay, None of the other drivers knew what Juicens was. So really? when the MD asked them, they said, I have no clue what Juicen is. That's shocking, isn't it? Yeah. I know. I know. So so the 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 sort of homework that I did to make sure I at least had some knowledge going into this. What was yeah. this? 86, was it? 87? No, 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 89. It was for the 89 later, right. season. Yeah. See, these are all the things that you have to pass on to the young drivers of today. Absolutely, yeah. But these are the things that you learn. And, and you kind of learn, not by mistake, but it's, it's the, these little things, you know, for you, that, that probably knowing that question probably secured the drive. You wouldn't totally. have been three champions. And, and it's one of those things, it's a chain of events. Maybe if you didn't get the question right, you wouldn't have got the drive. You might be, you might have been working, doing something completely different. You just don't know, do you? So, well, yeah. it left the farm to rack and ruin by this point, guys. So it probably yeah, no, I, I, absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I knew the team kind of wanted me as well. Yeah, because what I did in Class B, so I had experience in Formula Three, and there was a there was a. I, I know that from what people have said afterwards, but we were at Spa in Class B, and it was absolutely chucking it down, and I'd never been there. Um, I don't think many people had. I wasn't, you know, just went to Spa. Great, I've seen it all before on TV. Looks fantastic. It's absolutely bucketing down with rain. There's aquaplaning everywhere. And I was normally quicker than everybody else in class B, but I kept having on my board P2. And I was getting quite angry because I'm thinking I'm passing class A cars here. Who the hell is quicker than me? So I come in the pits to find out. I was PTO, P2 overall. Wow. <laughs> and, and that was the thing that got Bowman noticed, kind of went, okay, we need, he needs to be you know, on our list of, of drivers. So I think that also helped as well as knowing what... Um, Bowman, obviously, it was a Bowman chassis as well, wasn't it? Did Bowman do their own? No, it was a roll. It was a no. roll. Okay. Yeah, the Bowman came after, like two years after. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I remember, I mean, we, we talked before we started the podcast, but, you know, some great names. Again, you know, you talked about like people like Hakkinen and, 
Uh, it was, uh, it was, who else was in, in that year? I'm trying to think from, from my, in, my, in the British Championship? Yeah. Uh, well, there was Hakkinen, Mikasalo, um, yeah. uh, obviously Alan McNish. Uh, yeah. no, I, I, Hakkinen would have been in Ricard the Ricard Rydell, he won the first round. Ricard Rydell, uh, LA Menu. You know, when, I, when, when you look at the, the talent, like not only just there, but in Europe, because when we went to Macau at the end of the year, you had Schumacher, Zanardi, Morbidelli. Yeah. You know, there were, there, was, there, were, there were some very talented... Really? What happened? Those names just run off your tongue. It's just crazy. You guys are racing drivers talking about this, but I'm sat here in my garage hearing these names rolling off your tongue. And yeah, each one of those just conjures up things from my childhood. The thing is, Paul, at the time, you know, when, like, when, when David's there talking about hacking in and McNish and the they're just other racing drivers at the time. You know, they, you know the, the names now because of what they've gone on to achieve. But yeah, absolutely. Them, you don't. You, you'd be looking over at Mika Hakkinen. It's just some Finnish kid. You, you, it's a Finnish kid that you don't really know anything about. It's I talked to my boss, uh, Giles Butterfield, about this because he raced in, in British Formula Three. I think just before. That's right. For your before and yeah. um, brilliant guy, and we talk about this all the time because I'm I've got to think about that era of Formula Three and the fact that he just mentions names. You know, Martin Donnelly was at Cadwell Park yeah. last weekend, yeah. guy. And, um, I was chatting away to him, um, thinking, wow, and, guy, and Giles was like, well, say hello from me. You guys just have this, this network of people that the rest of the world looks at as heroes. That's something well, that I think you forget from time to time. You just meet all these great people and these great drivers. And, you know, people like Calvin Fish and, and that's over in America, and he commentates yeah. races. So, again, you know, he's maybe interviewing you, but, you know, you know the stuff that he's done. He was a hell of a driver. Um, you know, we talked about Tommy Byrne. You know, he was in America, you know, fantastic driver, you know, early, early, well, sort of 82, 83, you know, up to Formula One, you know, this great personality. Um, so, yeah, you get to meet some really great, great people. But, David, you talked about Macau. Sorry, I digress. I have to sometimes pull the racing driver out of you guys <laughs> just to align with the people listening at home who are thinking, wow, these names. <laughs> you talked about Macau there, David. So, what, what actually happened at Macau, David? How did you huh? get how did you get on at Macau? Well, I was fortunate enough to win, so um, I it, didn't it was. I didn't. Yeah, know. I mean, yeah, it was um, during the '89 season. There was protests between West Surrey Racing and Bowman, and I got my points taken away from me. I got 24 points or something taken away. McNish had 21 or something, and then they uh, West Surrey appealed. So Alan had his points, but it was under appeal. I lost my points. My team didn't appeal. So when we got to the end of this, I was, I think we were joint leading the championship right at the halfway point after the British Grand Prix. And then all, all this mess started. And then by time I lost 24 points, but by the time I got to Thruxton in the last race, I, 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 if I could have beaten Alan uh, or won the race, I could have won the championship with a 24 point deficit. That's how strong my end of season was. Yeah. And I crashed trying to do it in the first chicane. Um, and, and that was it. And he was declared the champion. And, and, I, and I went to Macau absolutely fuming, you know, that my championship had gone like that. So I had added motivation when I went to Macau. That, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. And, and I, I didn't qualify particularly well. I think I qualified eighth from memory. Um, but I knew I had a good race car. And I kind of probably focused more on that than the, the, the qualifying car. Yeah. Um, and then when we went down into the, the long straight into the tight right-hander, uh, Mir- was it Mirror, what's it called? Um, uh, Lisboa. Lisboa, Lisboa. Yeah. Lisboa, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're all going down the inside and everyone's to the right, to a right-hand corner. And I just got a sense, like, you know, when you're driving, you just, you just get a feel. You don't know what, you, you, you know there's some problem going to happen, but you yeah. can't. Your brain's not thinking it, but there's some sixth sense that's telling you. And I went with the sixth sense and I moved straight to the left to avoid everybody going down. Cause I just felt there was gonna, something was gonna happen. And it did, everyone crashed in. I, I managed, I was involved in the accident, but my car was actually okay. It wasn't damaged. Yeah. Race was stopped. It started again, but what it did, it eliminated a few of the top contenders, which made my life a bit easier in the race. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly McNish was was out, so they couldn't repair his car in time. Right, and and Michael Schumacher was there um, as well, and uh, he won the first heat, and I won the second heat, and I won, you know, I won, I won 
with the with the average. So uh, that was a huge thing for me because it was like it gave me the super license ticket. Yeah, you know, it gave me the ability to have a super license back then in F3. Was that how he did it? Could you qualify with just that race? Macau is such an amazing event. I mean, back then, I mean, you know, back then it was like you said, you've got the British Championship, which is probably probably the most competitive. But you have, you know, the best guys from the German Championship, French Champion, Italian Championship, all yeah. sort of go to that one race. Incredibly difficult circuit, um, high pressure weekend because everybody's everybody wants to be, you know, the, the British Champion wants to beat the German Champion, wants to beat the French. Yeah, champion. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so to, to, to do that and come out on top, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's an amazing uh, accomplishment. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know you'd actually won it, but, um, you know, and it's an amazing accomplishment. So, and to beat Schumacher, well, you know, what a great story. So, it's well, been quite yeah, a scary I, well, race in those days. Well, not really. I mean, it, the racing back then and the racetracks were, let's say, different to what they are today in terms of safety. And I, I, to be fair, I never really thought about safety. Uh, whatever it was, I just went out there and drove and respected what the limit was. Um, but any sort of danger, I wouldn't have been the one looking around the track going, oh, that looks a bit dangerous. We need to do something there. If that was where it was, that's where it was. And off I went. So I never never really thought about it. To be honest, so, Paul, the most dangerous thing of the weekend, like afterwards, to be honest, after the race, that's the moment. <laughs> <laughs> that's when it really gets dangerous, especially if Jason Plato's around. But that's another story. So, well, yeah, I mean, Eddie Irvine was in the race as well because some of the guys, you know, who'd been there, gone on to bigger things, would also come back. Yeah, that's um, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Julian Bailey finished third. Did he? You know, and he was he he was a former one driver at the time. Or I bet Eddie Irvine was an animal there. after the race, wasn't he? Um, I, I, you know what, I don't remember because I was with my girlfriend and we were well behaved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there go. was an after party. There was an after party. That's for sure. And we, we had a good time. Put it that way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so did that, so David, obviously having you know, done the F3 and then winning Macau, that obviously is just, they got your, your, your super license. So that was effectively your springboard then straight to Formula One. Is that, is that correct? Is that kind of um, it, uh, te technically no? I had um, I actually went and tested afterwards. I tested a former three thousand car for Eddie Jordan. Oh, okay, and, and ended up spinning. And the only thing I hit was a curb, but the curb actually took a hole, put a hole in the tub, so I couldn't test anymore. And Paul Tracy was there testing as well, right? Um, and I had to sit and watch. Paul Tracy go around for the rest of the day. Uh, it was when I went out. I was on slicks. It was part wet, part dry. Hadn't driven a powerful car like that before. And I think within like two laps, boom, I had gone sideways, slid sideways. Didn't do a three sixty, just slid sideways and then back on. But I hit the curb yeah. um, at Woodcut, and that was it. Um, and then I got signed to drive for Middlebridge in Formula Three Thousand. Uh, Damon Hill was going to be my teammate. Uh, we had Lola's, uh, which were the car to have, T uh, Tickford engines, they were the car, the engines to have. Mm -hmm. So it looked like a really good, strong package. We got the brand new cars, we set them up, we were going to go testing the next day, we we're in the workshop, and then we get pulled in, I get pulled into the office, and they say, look, we're closing the Formula 1 team, uh, so we're closing the Formula 3000 team down, and we want you to be in Formula One because Middlebridge had bought the Brabham team earlier. Okay. And actually, in fact, before that, they asked me to drive at Phoenix. You remember the first round in 1990 yeah. was at Phoenix where Jean Alesi like stunned everybody. Yeah. Uh, that week, they called me um, and said, would you like to come and do the Formula One race at Phoenix? And I went, well, I'm unfit. <laughs> I, I haven't driven the car before. And I said, no, I said, I didn't feel I was ready. Um, and well, that's a, that's a, 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 not a strange move, but I mean, you know, some drivers would, would just jump at the chance and say, well, I'll just wing it and see what I can do. But I guess you've got to have, you've got to have some confidence to be able to turn something like that down because at the end of the day it's Formula One. But I guess if you know, you, you you probably go with your gut feeling as to whether a whether the car is going to be competitive or whether you're going to do yourself justice and to be able to turn that down is quite quite boring. Yeah, I mean uh, it was, and 
But what it did was, from what I understand afterwards, you know, people went, well, hang on a minute. You know, he's got a bit of a sensible head on him. Mm. Um, and then when, you know, they were trying to decide what they do with, I think it was Greg Raw Fortech who was driving. Yeah. And, and they wanted to replace him. And then they thought, right, well, obviously, budgets were, I didn't know at the time, but Brabham were really struggling for money. Yeah. Uh, so what, when I when I got called in to say, right, we're cancelling the 3000 team. Yeah. Uh, I was either to, to go and look for another drive, which was late in the day, or, or go and be a Formula One driver in a Brabham. And of course, the, 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 the BT58, which they did the first two races, which I did my very first test in, which Sergio Rinland designed, was a fantastic car. I mean, you know, finished third at Monaco. So I told you that was a really good car for a small team like Brabham against the bigger guys. Uh, but the, the next car, when I joined, uh, was was a total disaster. So, you know, we really struggled throughout the year. No money. It yeah. was not a, not a great year from that point of view, but to have your very first Grand Prix at Monaco, sitting in a Brabham, knowing your dad's won there in 1959. Yeah. You know, you've got Prost, Senna, Mansell, PK, uh, all those Boots and Patrese, all those guys in front of you, yeah. uh, you know, it was a huge, huge moment. Yeah, yeah. How big was that moment when you did? I mean, it's easy to sort of skate over it and say I turned that drive down, but just take us to the the human part of that decision. How did it take you a while to come to that conclusion that you were going to say no? And how difficult was that? Did you think after you said it, have I just thrown away my chance? No, I did. I didn't. I mean, it didn't. I would say I, well, I've got to try and remember now, but I don't think it took me too long because. You know, I'm a fairly pragmatic kind of guy. It, it, it's got to make sense to me. If it doesn't make sense, then don't don't bother. Um, and it didn't make sense for me to go over there and jump in a car first practice, not having driven it. Don't, got to learn the circuit. And it's not like today where you could go off and yeah. drive the team simulator and get used to everything. You know, it, you didn't sit at home and watch the race and think, oh god, I could have been there. No, I didn't. No, I mean, I was so focused on F3000. That's, that's what it looked like. And, and I thought that was the best step for me. Um, and then when I went to Formula One, it was a bit of a bit of a shock because that wasn't really the plan. Um, it was either go and find another job or uh, be a Formula One driver for, for Brabham. You know, I mean, my, hell, my dad started that back in 1962. It's won World Championships. It's won 35 Grand Prix. It, as as Guy said at the very beginning, you know the name in the sport is 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 a big brand, and and so I felt I felt going there, I probably would have done it justice put it that way. Okay, that's, that's good, nice. So I mean, obviously you you that the that first year in Formula One with Brabham, it didn't quite work out. You know, the car wasn't competitive, but you you then went to sort of test driving for the next couple of years with with footwork. Uh, is is that correct, David? Yeah, and then. Um, also combining that with, with sports car racing. So that was your kind of mm -hmm. your first taste of, of the sports car racing. That was with, uh, with Tom Walkinshaw, was that, was that with the Jaguar? Yeah, that's correct. It was um, the XJR14 uh, Silk Cup Jaguar, which Ross Braun did. It was his last car that he ever actually designed himself, uh, which was so dominant at the first half of, of that year. Um, I actually was invited to drive in the XJR15 Intercontinental Challenge. It was Monaco, Silverstone and Spa. The winner of Spa got a million dollars. I finished I finished second behind Derek Warwick, who was at that time with Jaguar and the XJR14 program. Yeah. And during, during my time at Monaco, the guys at TWR said, look, how would you like to test the XJR14? And I'm thinking, Christ, yeah. I mean, that thing was such a rocket. Um, and they said, well, give us a call when you, when you get back to England. So I got back to England and rang them up and said, uh, right, so just ring up about the test. And then they said, there's no point in you testing if you're not going to drive for us. And I sat there for a minute and I went, I said, well, are you, hang on, are you offering me a drive? And they said, yeah, we'd like you to finish the season in the XJR uh, 14. Great. Now I was doing Formula 3000 at the time. I, I did about four races. The team was struggling for money. I knew it was, you know, a bit 
probably not going to happen. Yeah. So this came along at the perfect time for me because um, I went I went back to the to Team Roni, who I was with, yeah. and I said, look, guys, I've got this offer. Uh, what do you think? And they said, look, this is a great opportunity for you. you know, you've yeah. got to go for it. So I rang Jagger back and said, right, we're on. What was Tom Wilkins your like? Tom? Yeah, I mean, he was a character. There's, there's no, a very strong Scottish character. Um, and I never had a problem with Tom, but I know a lot of people did. Uh, and he had a, had a bit of a rogue type reputation. Uh, but it was, a, it was the, having been at Brabham and then gone to TWR with the Silk Cup Jaguar team, the difference in level of, well, the car performance was another level, but the professionalism of the team, you know, there was budget there to do things right. Uh, we tested. I was actually in a strange position because I was the third driver, which meant that I started in one car and finished in the other. So Teo Fabi and Derek Warwick had their cars and it was a three hour race normally. So I would do one hour in one car, get out, they'd do a double. I'd wait for the other car to do a double and I'd finish in the other one. So in my first race, I finished first and second at the Nürburgring, which was a pretty cool <laughs> career. <laughs> did you, did you like the sports cars? Did you kind of take to it? Did you kind of, was, this, was it something that you kind of had thought about or was it just something that you kind of did it and thought, well, this is like pretty cool, you know? I was still... You know, Formula One was a bit like unfinished business, mm. I guess. And but having done sports cars in '91 with Jaguar, uh, working <laughs> with team, working with teammates very differently to how you do in Formula One or, or single seater racing in general, um, the atmosphere, the way people had to work together, it 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 seemed to resonate with me as a person and as a competitor, and I loved that type of racing. Yeah. Uh, so it was a good experience for me i mean having i don't think they probably would have chosen me if i hadn't done formula one the year before mm -hmm. because i had f1 experience um i'd shown well in f3 obviously but I'd, I'd had f1 experience and they were prepared to to give me a a go which was which was great and yeah. you know i held my own against you know two very good drivers with derek and tayo yeah so Dave, when was your first trip to le mans when was your first visit to le mans then uh, the year after, 92 with Toyota. And that was Toyota, okay. Yeah. And uh, was Le Mans sort of on your, was it kind of on your radar or was it kind of, or did that just come about because you were with Toyota or how did, how did that sort of... No, it was something that were, you know, Le Mans, I, that, when I think about that time reading the autosports, you know, in the, in the kind of 70s and 80s, I was, I was, I'd loved... You know, I loved the old Porsches, you know, the 956s and, you know, just that era was amazing. Um, Derek Bell, Stefan Belloff, you know, all those, Bob Wallach, all those guys. Sure, you know what, Le Mans held something for me and when that opportunity came up. Uh, and in fact, the only, unfortunately, in some way, the opportunity only came up because the Japanese driver that was driving for them got killed in a Formula 3000 accident uh, at Suzuka. Um, I think his name was Agawa, something like that. Um, and so they, were, they needed a driver to replace him, uh, to drive with Jeff Lees. And so I, I, I got the call because obviously my experience and I'd shown well in, in 91. The Jaguar program finished in 91. Yeah. Uh, at the end of 91 so it was off looking for something else and uh, I got the call to do to do the Jaguar uh, sorry the Toyota program so that was my very first uh, Le Mans in, in, in the car. And what do you think to Le Mans first time? Well I mean what unbelievable place you you don't really know till you go there and drive in a really what it means yeah um, and I was a third driver and I didn't really get a lot of time in the car before the race. Uh, and then on the start, Jeff Lee's going down the Mulsanne straight, not seeing where he was going because it was just horrendous rain. Uh, Yannick Dalmas hit him up the back because he was backing off because he just couldn't see anything. You know, he just didn't know where to brake or anything. 
So he started to back off and then, you know, up, up the rear. Yannick Delmes and the Peugeot hits him. Boom, boom, boom in the barriers. And he brings the car back, you know, with literally two wheels. And uh, that was it, really. I mean, by the time I got in the car, by the time they fixed it, which was, you know, they did a lot to get it fixed. They did a great job. Yeah, a long way down. When, but when it was my turn in the car, it was night. It was still pissing to hell of rain. And the, there was so much fog, you couldn't see where you're going. So I ended up going down the Mulsanne Strait, thinking, I really don't know where I am, what I'm doing here. Where, where's the breaking point? I didn't get out of third gear the whole lap. All right. The interesting thing is no one passed me. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? so it, it, and then the next lap, I, I've got, come on. You 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 gotta you know you gotta keep pushing, mate. So down the mole sound straight, I'm flat out in fourth, in sixth. No, 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 no. This time, this time, stupidly in sixth, literally going blind in the middle of the crown of the of the road where the white lines are, hoping at some point I'm going to see a brake marker, you know, down on the left, down there, yeah. down into the first chicane, and I have to say it was terrifying, absolutely <laughs> terrifying. Uh, and it wasn't comfortable, wasn't comfortable. And that was my introduction to the mall. Wow. Yeah. Did you find the brake marker? Clearly you did. Luckily, yeah. But I mean, on that first lap, when I, when I went out of Mulsanne Corner and you got the two kinks, I went straight on. I, I didn't know where the kinks were. I went straight onto the grass, oh, 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 back on again. Um, that's so that's, dark, that's what it was like. It's, huh? it's, so, it's so dark in places, Paul. You're going so yeah. quick that only by experience it's kind of like you kind of know what's coming so you kind of make those small corrections for the kinks because just just because your muscle memory but you've never been there before or, or it's raining or you're foggy you get you, you get disorientated so and you're traveling so quick that they just come up and they they come up so quick that you've got to be at Le Mans you've always got to be two or three steps ahead of the car all the time you know because if, if you're driving on just on reaction not on ice. Those, those conditions must really take their toll physically I know I'm trying to liken it to something. So, you know, someone listening to this who has driven on the motorway in torrential rain, the sort of rain that you'd normally pull over in, and you don't know if you're going to aqua play or not. You come out of that and you, you've gripped the steering wheel so hard, your hands are aching and you, you're sweating. and you're, you're doing that at 200 plus miles per hour, right? Basically. Yeah. yeah. And with no vision and with a lot more at stake. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And that's what, that's yeah. what makes that's it. sink in, anyone listening at home. You know, we, we listen to these guys talk about Le Mans. It's difficult, you know, if you've not driven it. It just, it sounds utterly you, terrifying. You've driven, you've driven down the motorway and it's pouring with rain and you're doing 100 mile an hour and the car starts aquaplaning. And you, you, it's like, it's like you're, you're the only one moving into the fast lane. Everyone's in the slow lane. You're moving into the fast lane and there's standing water and the car's moving around. And you, don't, you literally don't know what it's going to do. So you, 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 all your senses are just heightened and you just, you're just reactive to whatever the car's doing. And, you know, but you've got to, you know, that's, that's the, you know, that's the art of sports car racing is dealing with the unknowns, dealing with the different adverse conditions, whether it be nighttime, daytime, fog, as David said, you know, what he described there is kind of worst case scenario because the cars tend to fog up. So you can't see, you know, the aqua plane because they're low to the ground and big floors. Uh, but that's, that means that when you get to the end and you complete it, it's a real result. And if you get on the podium, even better. And if you win it even better again. So that's why it's such a challenge. Um, but did, did, Dave, just go back to the Nissan. Did you win? You win um, Spa as well, Spa Twenty Four. Yeah. So ninety one. Uh, I think it was ninety one. Was it ninety two? Can't even remember now. What's it say on the sheet? I think it says ninety one. I think it says 91. yeah. Ninety ninety one. I got. I was actually also testing in Japan for Nissan. Right. So I was testing a GTR Nissan, and I was testing their sports car, and. Um, I uh, got invited to drive at Spa for the 24-hour race uh, with Anders Olofsson, who yeah. sadly passed away. Uh, and Asami, I think, or Hattori. I think it might have been Hattori. And, yeah, we ended up winning, you know, first first time. Um, in fact, we, we won by some stupid margin because we were quite fast. We led every lap. 
the BMWs, all the snits of BMWs, the word BMWs all broke down. Last one broke on the last lap while we were three laps in front of that one. Right. And we were 21 laps in front of P3. So we actually ended up winning by 21 laps. Oh, decent. That's, that's a win and a half. Yeah, not, exactly. not many, not many Australians that. have won it, have they? I, I think I'm the only one. I'm the, I definitely am the only one to have won Spa 24 hour and Bathurst 1000. Yeah. Yeah. And then David, so then obviously onto, you know, one more shot at the Formula One with the Simtech team. Um, you know, obviously again, you know, a, a small team, um, new team. I um, mean, again, you know, it must've been a, a little bit of a challenge, but again, it, it gives us another opportunity to get back into Formula One car and, and give it another shot. Uh, obviously, a difficult year, as we know, with, with what happened that year with, with Roland's uh, accident, of course, with that, I, you know, Ayrton's crash. A difficult time, I'm sure. But, um, you, know, did, you know, how did you feel about sort of going back into Formula One again? Was it, was it, was it, was it, a, was it a tough year? As, 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 as uh, I, was, I was, let's say, more ready for t- my second year of Formula One than I was in my first. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you know, any new team in Formula One with very little money is a massive challenge. Yeah. You know, Nick Worth, um, who I've worked with several times throughout this, our period of, of racing together, yeah. um, was I was 28, he was 28. He was the designer and he ran the team. And uh, it, it was a big challenge for us to get through that season. Yeah. Uh, Roland got signed up. Uh, he, uh, he found some, you know, everyone had to find money in the, in the second car and he managed to find some money to get through the first few races for sure, yeah. mm-hmm. which got the team going. So, you know, you want to keep that momentum going and other opportunities come down the road. Um, uh, but unfortunately, obviously at Imola, uh, his life was taken, uh, in qualifying for, for the Grand Prix then. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, I'd never lost a teammate. Formula One hadn't lost a, a driver for a long time. It was big news, you know, and we really didn't know how to handle it. You know, it was, I wasn't experienced enough in that area of, of like my dad was, you know, he lost a lot of friends back then. But, um, you know, for me, it was a big, it was a big shock for the team. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, and then the next, the next day, Ayrton goes as well. So yeah. even as a kid, I remember how that felt. Yeah. Him. Hearing that news the first day and, and the second day. Do, do you feel? Do you feel? Do you feel um, not cheated? I, w- I wonder whether is. Do you feel that you didn't? You didn't get you know the the shot in Formula One that you deserved. I mean, you obviously you you got to Formula One, which is you know more than I did and more than a lot of drivers did. But you know, do you feel that you didn't get the opportunity that you you, you perhaps your talent deserved? Um, I I didn't get the opportunity to drive a let's say a competitive car yeah um it is what it is i mean i i couldn't change it at the time um i actually could have got the jordan drive if i had half a million bucks yeah you know um when they first started but i never had i never had the money and i've never paid for a drive in my life you know what i mean so um I was fortunate enough to, to have the experience of being a Formula One driver. I learned a lot throughout the period. I don't regret it. Um, it made me a better sports car driver and I had a very long, successful career in, in sports cars. Yeah. And those life experiences uh, were, were good foundations, certainly moving forward. And it made me, I think, have a, have a long career. Yeah. And of course, you're touring cars as well, because I remember when I was racing Formula Renault, 1995. I remember you in the old. Uh, you were in the old. Was it? Was it Snitzer the BMW? Was it a Snitzer BMW? Who ran it that No, it was a BMW, but it was Team Vatlofer. Okay, right. So Snitzer had been there obviously before. Yeah. Vatlofer won in Germany. Okay. Um, I don't remember why they swapped, but they they swapped. So Snitzer went to Germany, and Vatlofer <laughs> with Johnny Chicotto came to Germany. Yeah. I'd done Formula One the year before, actually through Nick Worth, helped me to go to, uh, he spoke to Paul Rosher and said, have you got anything for something with David? And an opportunity was there any, you know, they, they had a slot. Um, and I did the deal with, with 
BMW in Germany to race in England in the 1995 Touring Car Championship, which... Um, what, what, a, what a, an era. I mean, again, yeah. touring cars, that was the era. I mean, that was, I mean, when I was coming up, you know, seeing, seeing all those manufacturers, BMW... Oh, God, yeah, that was amazing. And the that, names that you'd race with in Formula 3 as well, really reunited. Yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. We, uh, amongst, you know, tin top, you know, legends, you know, Tim Harvey, uh, John Cleland, uh, Patrick Watts, Paul Radisic. Um, you know, I actually raced against Paul in New Zealand in the Tasman series, so it was nice yeah. to sort of see him again. Um, but I can always remember my very first test at... Um, uh, where was it? Um, it was in Italy. And it, I'd just come out of a Formula One car into a two litre touring car and off I went. And, and it was like breaking for, for the corner. It was like, whoosh, ooh, there goes the apex. You know, I can't, I can't stop this thing. Why is this thing not stopping? You know, and uh, it was a massive learning curve to get my head around driving something with no grip. Yeah. And you went quicker betting the brakes in as you did trying to force a time out of it. You know, it was just a, a crazy kind of thing to do. But uh, yeah, Chicotta as a teammate, because he was, again, he was like, you know, yeah. he was a bit of a legend in the touring cars, wasn't he? Or is it, you know, it, it must have been quite, quite a, a challenge. But um, yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, again, a great period for touring cars and, and to be a part of it must have been, must have been fantastic. But it was you did one year in touring cars, didn't you? Then you kind of go, then you kind of went really kind of sports car. You kind of focus then purely on, on the sports car. Yeah, it was a, a bit of frustration, I think, with the touring car stuff because BMW, Johnny finished one place in front of me and I missed one round because my son got burnt in Scotland and ended up in hospital. So um, he finished literally, I don't know what kind of it was, 15th and I finished 16th. It was a yeah. terrible year for, for BMW. The cars just weren't competitive. Yeah. at all um, and I was looking really to get back into sports cars something a bit bigger a bit more you know a bit more grip a bit more power um, and I ended up uh, doing a deal to race in Japan in the All Japan GT Championship with um, Team Go yeah. uh, racing with John, John Nielsen uh, Ralph Schumacher was in the other car uh, in the Lark McLarens uh, so that was a good opportunity for me to get back into sports cars. And, and I raced at Le Mans that year um, as well. So it was, yeah, it was good. And of course, Bathurst with, uh, with Jeff. Got that in a That's place. right. It's a winning Bathurst in the with BMW Australia. BMW. Yeah, BMW Australia. Yeah, that was a fantastic moment because, you know, to win Bathurst is a big deal. Yeah. But to, to, to win it with your brother... Yeah. Uh, who, Jeff, who I go on really well with and have a huge amount of respect for what he's achieved in his career. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was really special to, to have won that one. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then kind of, is that kind of where you joined with Paynos then? Was that the kind of where the Paynos sort of theories of... Well, it's funny because, um, no, the, where was it? So when did I win Bathurst? 97, wasn't it? 90, oh, I've got, well, I've got 96 down here. Uh, yeah, maybe. I, I can't remember. Um, so, drove with Jeff. That's right. And then, um, as I was trying to figure out what I was going to do in '97, I was in negotiations with McLaren to do another year. And I went to uh, Argentina with Gordon Murray to start developing the long tail McLaren. Oh. And, I, and we were trying, kind of do this deal and, and I was felt like I was getting dicked about a bit with McLaren. Dave Price, who was running the, the new panel sort of deal, was, kept ringing me, you know, oh, I want you to be our, our driver, I want you to be our lead driver, I want you to be our driver. And I, and I said, look, I've got this deal here with McLaren. Um, if it doesn't come off, I'll give you a call. And, and it, it just got to the point where I said, guys, do you want me or not at McLaren? Yeah, oh, yeah, no, we want you. And they, I said, well, how much are you paying? They said, well, we're, we're not going to pay you anything. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> uh, okay, put the phone down. I was on holiday, actually, in, in the um, uh, Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And I spent a lot of time and money on the bloody phone. <laughs> and I, 
I pick up the phone to Dave Price. I said, Dave, what's the deal? He told me what the deal is. I said, right, we're on. So I put the phone down, picked up the deal to McLaren and said, look, guys, got another deal. Thanks very much for your offer, but you know, I, I'm, I'm doing something else. Put the phone down. So great, done. Next day, Lisa's, my wife's mother, calls, or no, sends a fax that had come through to my house that was a deal from McLaren that all of a sudden they found some money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I, but, but to me, I, I'd agreed. That's like a handshake to me. And so yeah. it's done. So that was it. Uh, I stayed with Panos. That deal with McLaren only lasted one more year and, and that all fell apart. And I spent six years driving a front engine monster. Yeah, It I mean, was a monster as well. It's one of the, the big monsters of racing when I was a kid watching the Panos. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that thing was just, it was just, just crazy, wasn't it? I mean, just crazy looking, crazy sounding. And the performance of it was just, it just, it's just astounding really for what it did. Yeah. And, 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 you know, when I kind of started with the sports car race, you know, I was kind of doing Indy Lights and racing the States. And obviously you started following the ALMS because I knew Stefan. So, you know, he was racing in it and stuff and one thing. But, so I kind of really kind of started to follow the ALMS because it really started to grow, didn't it? It really started to become, again, you know, it was one of those classes that got more competitive, more manufacturers, BMW were there, you know, Audi were coming in and stuff. And it just was building. So again, a great era of sports car racing. Um, and I remember obviously with you, you particularly with Brabs as a, as a, as a, as a, as a pairing, uh, fighting against yeah, the Audi. Mags. Yeah. Mags. Uh, sorry, Max. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, but what was, what was, um, Don Panos like, uh, Brabs? Cause I mean, you know, I've heard so many stories about him, about, you know, just how, how smart he was and how he was just such a great guy. I mean, you know, you obviously probably know him as good as anybody, certainly in the racing world. You know, how was he? Yeah. Um, Don was an interesting character because um, he did. He obviously did very well in business. A pharmaceutical guy that sold his business, rumored to be at the time in the kind of eighties, like a couple of billion. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, there were big, big numbers. And he had resorts. He, he, I mean, he had his hand in everything. And of course, his son Danny was wanted to produce road cars so the panos road car came about and you know danny convinced his dad that they need to go racing they need to show panos on the racetracks uh and i can remember actually re picking up an autosport and re reading this seeing this picture of this panos with the engine front engine cover off seeing the engine there at the front and i'm thinking hang on my dad put the engine in the back and was the first to win a world championship with the engine in the back in 19 Six fifty nine, nineteen fifty nine. 1959, you know what I mean? Why would I ever see myself in that thing? You know, that's that was sort of the thing that went through my mind when I first saw that program. And I think that really shows a bit about Don because I think people said to him, Don, no, you're never going to make this work with putting the engine in the front. That was it. No, nah, we're going to put the engine in the front because he just had to show people that, that, that it could be done if someone said that it couldn't. Did you get a cool uh, company car? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. Uh, there was a. There was a. They. They were going to do a David Brabham and a Jan Magnussen edition panels. So Jan did his, um, and I kind of was taking a bit more time than Jan. And I. And at the time they were open top, and I. Yeah. And I. And I drove it, and I just kind of felt they were twisting too much. So I thought, right, let's put a roof on it. And I managed to convince them to put this roof on, on the panels at the time, um, the Esperante. And um, it, it was, for me, it was a big improvement from a handling wise, aesthetically um, and torsional. And anyway, every other bloody panels after that put a roof on it. So it wasn't a David Abraham edition, but what I, what I did was part of that development phase that improved the vehicles to, for them to then adopt that for their, for their future vehicles. So um, it was great to be involved in that program. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But for many reasons and, you know, Don without, without Don sports cars probably would have died in America. Yeah. Cause he was, you know, he, he, he also, he also founded the American Le Mans series too, didn't he? So yeah. Not only did they have a race team in the series, he, he was the racing series. And I think he could see that, um, you could see that Mom was, it was a huge, huge event. But 
outside of Le Mans, there wasn't really any kind of these amazing cars. There was nowhere really for them to race. And, and you know, the American Le Mans series was born. So you had the Sebring 12 hours and, and, and uh, you know, Petit Le Mans and all the rest of it and, 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 and fantastic events. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, great, great, you know, great times for sure. Um, and you glad that we wheeled the panels into the uh, virtual studio, David. We've, we've done that with each guest. We've, Guy and I now have a discussion about which car we should wheel in. Yeah, yeah right. Well, I saw the picture, actually. I saw you use the... the Paul was asking panels. me, what, what car should we put for... There were too many. I could not decide. I was trying to get the juicing car in. I mean, it's like... Yeah. There was so, so many tunes. I said, well, what about the Peugeot? You know, we could do the Peugeot, but, you know, the, for me, what yeah. I think of you, I think of the panels. So, right. go with the panels. Just, it just, it's okay. just what I associate with, because when I was kind of coming up, that's what you were driving. I've um, got a silk-cut Jaguar above the bed in our bedroom but I've, I've had so much trouble from my wife on that one so I couldn't put the silk yeah. in there. Right. <laughs> so, so after panels then David you kind of you kind of went and did more like the the sort of stuff with Pro Drive with the with the Ferrari and, and of course Aston Martin and, and you had you know, numerous uh, class wins at Le Mans. Um, mm. you know, you're, you're obviously been very successful with the GT car. I mean you've kind of moved around I mean you've done you know Formula One, you've done touring car, you've done you know high powered sports cars, you've raced the American Le Mans series you know um, GT1. I mean, you've kind of done it all, um, and then of course back to back to the LMP again. Um, obviously, with with you know with the, with the Bentley in, in 2003 um, as, as in the sister car to 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 us um, in, mm -hmm. in car eight. You know, we certainly um, you know had a lot of fun. You know, that, that program was only a year in kind of in in in, in running in theory um with the with that program i know it was a three-year program but that particular team was only one year but we only did two races but of course you know it was a lot of fun we, we had um mark blondell on on a previous show and uh you know we, i think it was it was good times you know we, we had that real competition between us but a lot a lot of healthy respect and me being kind of like the junior kid in the team you know to be learning from people like yourself and and johnny and tom and you know it was it was a real for me to soak up, soak up all that experience, um, but in a good way. You know, everybody was always very respectful and, and got on well. But there was this mm. definitely a lot of competition between the two cars. But I think it was in a in a in a good way. And of course, the race itself. You know, luckily, <laughs> luckily we beat you. We had a little bit more luck. I think it could have gone either way because both cars were very strong. And you know, you had a couple of small issues with your car, and that was the difference between um, you know between who won really. But you know. It definitely was a, was a great time. Um, and, and, and you know what, Guy, I, I wasn't till I was racing in Aston Martin in 2007. We we're about to win the race. I'm, the, I'm in the car. It's, it's absolutely hammering it with rain. Um, it's a safety car. Everyone's aquaplaning behind the safety car and then they go green to get to the finish with like 45 minutes to the end or 40 minutes to the end. And I, all, all of a sudden I've got Aston Martin's win, which they hadn't done for so long. A bit like you, when you were, when you're in the car, yeah. the conditions were better, but the pressure for you to get that thing across the line without making a mistake. I actually, after the race, I thought about you and how, what you must have felt with all that pressure yeah. to get to get that car across the line because it was Bentley's first win in God knows how many yeah. years. You know what I mean? It's tough, isn't it? Because at that point, you, you, your mind can start to wander and, you know, you, you can start to write your own headlines and you start to listen every to every engine note, every gear shift, and you're just thinking it can only go wrong. Um, and, of course, it's, 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 been, it's happened in the past where drivers have crashed, um, you know, with, with an hour or two to go. So... Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, it, it was it was still a great a great year, and 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 certainly, um, you know, it, it was it was great for me to get to get to get the win. But you know, it, I, you know, I felt for you guys finished second because you also deserved the win. But of course, you were able to get that win, you know, a few a few years later later on with the with the Peugeot, um, and you know, you got you got that that overall win. Um, so yeah, obviously class victories in the GT1 and and an overall one in the in LMP. And of course, I didn't realize that Jeff had. Of course, as I was reading through the notes, you know, Jeff was an amazing driver. I mean, fantastic career. Um, but I didn't, I didn't actually realize that he'd actually won Le Mans, and not only did he won Le Mans, he'd also won in a Peugeot. Uh, yeah. 
1993. Well, the, 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 the only time Peugeot won Le Mans like that was, was with your uh, Brabham's being in the car. So, you know, well, you know Peugeot are coming back, right? So we're going to yeah. see Sam Brabham in there, maybe? Well, yeah, Sam should give him a call, or Matthew, both of them. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> if they want to win Le Mans, they're going to have to have a Brabham in there. Uh, absolutely. Well, history would tell us such a thing, yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, of course you know, and lastly, you know, the back in the America Le Mans series um, with uh, with Highcroft, um, you know, working with the Acura. Obviously, we raced together. I was at Dyson. You you were at uh, Highcroft. So we've had many you know battles with it. Be LMP two, mm. uh, which then became LMP one. Um, and I think probably like myself, you know, really enjoyed racing in the US. You know, the racing is incredibly tough, um, but a nice vibe. You know, good, mm. good paddock. Um, great circuits and I think we've been very lucky you know to, to get to you know I look back now you know how fortunate you, you probably don't realize it at the time but I look back now and I think god you know we had some really good times um, and, and, and you know you must feel the same way again maybe not so many cars that there was there was back in the day but but good close hard racing um, the, yeah I, I, for me I thoroughly enjoyed racing in America and all for the reasons you've just mentioned, you know, the, the, the people, the, the tracks, the tracks were still dangerous. You know what I mean? They still are. They haven't changed much, which I, I love. Um, There's the tire and, wars as well. You don't get the tire wars anymore, do you? Yeah, no. I mean, it, it, the, the sort of, community that you felt and family atmosphere through there and, and and teams would help one another but out on track it was dog eat dog you know what i mean it was hard tough tough racing yeah um and my highcroft period i think was i think my best period in racing as a driver yeah. particularly in 2008 i kind of hit a purple patch i felt like i could just Whatever I did, I could, it, it, it kind of turned to gold in a sense. You know what I mean? You just kind of went through this freaky time. Uh, I had so much confidence. I had the, the whole, you know, the Highcroft people around me, the Honda people around me, the Worth research, Nick Worth back in again, because he helped me get the drive with that one as well. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I, I raced with Stefan as my teammate. Yeah. Um, obviously, Stephen Janssen and, you know, Scott Sharp, uh, Simon Pagano uh, through that period yeah. and racing against Porsche, racing against Penske, racing against Dyson, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Klaus Graf and, and his team. What was that called? Uh, yeah, Muscle Sport. Sport. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sport. yeah. Sport, uh, yeah. And, and, and at the front there, it was so competitive and I had some of the best racing ever. Yeah. In, in that period. Well, you know, back to championships. Was it 2009, 2010? Uh, yeah. Back to championships. So again, it's just, I, you know, it, it's that thing, isn't it? It's, it's when you know you're driving well and you've got the experience and you've got the team around you, you just, you know, you just execute every weekend. It, it's, it's, it's just great, isn't it? You know, it's just a great mm. place to be. Um, and of course, you know, Highcroft, you know, great team, you know, a well-funded, well-turned-out professional mm. team. You know, look great. Cars look great. Really good. And those yeah. Acuras were, you know, were fantastic cars, weren't they? And of course, you they did a lot great of to drive. Great to drive. You yeah. did a lot of yeah. development, didn't you, on that? So yeah, yeah. With with Nick, um, you know, when we first started that program, we ran with um, a Courage chassis, uh, chassis, and uh, yeah, and when they first tested it. I didn't do that test, but it was like way off the pace. Mm. I mean, way off the pace. Worth then took on, took it on, and completely redid the aerodynamics on it. Mm. You know, completely look different look of car. Chassis is the same, obviously with the, with the uh, Acura engine in the back. Yeah. And um, I, I turn up. We turn up at uh, qualifying uh, for Sebring. And this is the first proper run for the car. We qualified second, mm. you know, so for Highcroft, bang, we were there. Mm. Acura, great, you know, great addition to what we were doing in terms of the, the pace of the car uh, and up against Penske and Porsche, you know, two of the hugest names in the yeah. industry. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it started off really well, you know, in, in that sense. And, and as a driver, you know, it's like when you've got 
those kind of talented people around you and there's this absolute desire to win and and development parts of going through working with worth going on the simulates because we started a simulator program in 2007 um it, it just was a golden period for me where I, where i kind of felt i had everything around me finally where i could I could take myself to a whole new level, which, yeah. which is what I was able to do. Yeah. yeah. The thing about you, Dave, is you're actually you're quite a deep thinker, aren't you? You quite you quite um, you're not not to say you're not a typical racing driver. You, you're quite thoughtful and think about about it. And, and I can imagine you as a if you want a team leader pulling everybody together and quite enjoying that aspect as much as you, you're having success in driving on the track you know, you also get a great buzz off the track and in, in, they say pulling the key people in and getting them all to, all to work together and fixing yeah. problems. And then when you got on track and you, you, you're successful, it's just like, that's like the ice on the cake, isn't it? Because it's like... Yeah, you're, you're, at, you're absolutely right. Um, as I got older, I started to realise that actually there is, there's much more to it than just you being a driver going as fast as you can. Yeah. Um, and then you get all that experience, you're working with different people, you see personalities, you see the way the team think, you see what the culture is like, um, how much do they believe in what they can achieve, how can you turn that maybe lack of belief into belief to create results. Yeah. I found the last 15 years of my career, I spent a lot of time doing that. And that was my most successful period, I believe. Yeah. Because, because I was old enough, mature enough, I was still quick enough, but I had a real sense of how this team needed to be and the way, it th where, the, way the thinking was, the culture, mm -hmm. uh, at each event and tweak whatever I could. If there was a problem, deal with it, you know, bring it in, make it one unit. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely really enjoyed that side of it. Yeah, it leads us on to the uh, the, the current chapter in a way, doesn't it? Uh, I know a few of the questions that we had on Twitter were about the BT sixty two and mm. and about the the road car project. Yeah, which you, you're doing a similar thing there, really, aren't you? You've led on that, and um, can you tell us yeah. a bit about where that sure. is? Okay, so you know we talk we've been talking about my career now when I was let's say just before the Highcroft time, um, I was thinking 10 years ahead. I was thinking, okay, I'm 40. What, what's going to happen when I'm 50? You know, I'm going to be too old, too slow. No one's going to want me. What, what, what can I do? What is my next chapter? You know, so I started to think 10 years in advance. And I just thought, you know, we got this iconic racing name, Brabham surely we should be doing something with it. Um, and then I started to look into it and then discovered that um, somebody else had registered it in Germany. So we didn't quite own the name as we thought. Uh, so I, during that period of, let's say 2006, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12, I was in a court battle to get the, the Brabham name back. Who was the, who had taken it? What happened then? Uh, it's a guy in Germany. And, you know, when, when I started looking into it, we didn't know what they were doing. It wasn't public at that point, but it wasn't long after that. Uh, they were pimping up BMW M5s and calling them Brabham Racing, the legend returns, and they called it a BT92. So selling T-shirts with my dad's face on it. You, you know, it was all, all that kind of thing. So I, I kind of felt that it was my duty to to get the name back mm -hmm. and I did it on my own. Um, I didn't have any other family um, involvement and Christmas day, 2012, I got the name back. Um, so it was then, all right, I've literally burnt through every penny I got to get the name back for the legal costs. Now what? And I had to start all over again. Yeah. And, um, and there was, you know, some challenging times mm -hmm. to be fair, but what I'd learned in racing about, you know, challenge yourself and not giving up and, and digging deep. I went into a world, um, I don't know if Guy can relate to this or not, but you know, you're, you're cocooned as a racing driver. Mm -hmm. And then you, you kind of step into the outside world for the first time and it's a massive culture shock. Yeah. For me, I had no idea how the real world worked and, yeah. it, and it surprised me. 
And you, you and as a competitor, as I was, and be, always being quite hard on myself, I was never truly satisfied. There was always somewhere where I could do better. Yeah. When, I, when I got into the real world, I was beating myself up because I didn't know any of this stuff. So when I say this stuff, you know, we were trying to raise money, we were trying to get projects up and running, uh, and I didn't have a clue where to start, you know. Um, what I did know is that with a brand, I wanted to turn an iconic racing name into a global brand. I wanted to create a new chapter for Brabham. I wanted to create a legacy for my family. Um, I just didn't know how to do it. I, it was just a dream and a vision. Mm. So then um, after a, a couple of attempts and, you know, we, we started a thing called Project Brabham where we wanted to get, you know, the fans involved, uh, go and do LMP2 and, and raise money. And, and that was the difficult part was going out there and raising money for a project like that, which was really just an idea. It was very different. Um, and it was a challenge. And then it was a case, okay, well, that's not working. We're going to have to park that and find another way of doing it. And then I got introduced to uh, a private equity group in Australia called Fusion Capital. Uh, they were involved in advanced manufacturing. They were one of their businesses was a tier one supplier to Ford, Holden, Toyota. Those those automotive business companies disappeared out of Australia, so there was no more production. All the supply chains had to do something different, and they were they were looking at what they could do. So they the first started. Uh, looking into building buses. Uh, so now they're the biggest bus manufacturer in the world, uh, not the world, in, in Australia. And the, the, they also wanted a kind of halo product, which could show and demonstrate the expertise coming out of Adelaide. Mm -hmm. I was looking for partners that one, had the cash, and two, had the expertise. And so together we created Brabham Automotive, we created the Brabham BT62. We launched it a couple of years ago as the ultimate track car. Customers said, great, but you know, can I put it on the road? Can I race it? So we now have three variants within the 70 that we're only building of the BT62. Yeah. Um, we, did the, the, uh, we did a race in November at the Brick Car Endurance Round into the night where we won our first race. So for me, having you know, to cross the line on Brabham Strait in a Brabham, just as my dad did in 1966 for the British Grand Prix when he won in a Brabham, uh, was a really special moment. Um, and I think back to that, that kind of journey of getting to that point, which wasn't easy, you know, that yeah. wasn't, it was yeah. quite a challenge. So to, 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 you know, find a partner, get a deal done, you know, get the designs done, get the, get the car built, get it developed, launch it, you know, take it to market, sell it, get cars on the production line into customers' hands, you know, we've achieved that. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's massive. Um, you're into the 70, are you? Yeah, we're only building 70 of the BT60. How far in, into them are you? Into what do you mean? How many have you built so far? Or have you built the 70? No, we, we, we don't still tell money. Yeah, yeah, we don't, we don't, production started and deliveries have just started. So, yeah. um, you know, we've got, COVID has, has obviously slowed things down from a supply point of view. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's an exciting project. And obviously there is a, there's going to be a motorsport arm when the, when the company's kind of matured enough to be able to support that. And then we're just going through that phase. Now we're hoping to do a few more races this year, but COVID, yeah, put an end to that. Yeah. Uh, so things have been pushed pushed down the road a little bit. There's a beautiful uh, car, but it's really exciting. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful looking. I mean, it's a great looking car. Yeah, it's um, awesome. And do you not do you not think that do you not find you said about the challenge of when you kind of stepped into the real world and and you know I've kind of experienced that um, as I've gone on kind of sort of winding down on my racing and and kind of going to sports and and stuff and looking at the commercial side of it. I mean, it is it is a challenge because. You know, in everything you've done, you've been successful and you've had control over and you've had an element of control and then you step out and it's like, hmm, like it's, it's all different. It's so different. Yeah. Kind of what I've found is, as I'm finding my way, is actually a lot of the skill set that you learn in racing is transferable because actually, although, you know, because you learn to negotiate, you learn how to self-motivate, you learn how to deal with people, which is really important, you know, because you... It's about getting the best out of people and 
been adaptable. So you've got to be able to speak to a team boss, to a mechanic, to, to whatever it may be. And, and you find actually, although you may, you may not have all the, uh, uh, the, 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 the college degrees and all the rest of it, what you have got is a lot of life experience, which you can actually use in everyday life and actually is quite powerful. But it, it's just, you've, you've got to find your confidence a little bit. You've got to find your feet. But I mean, you must have found, you know, to have that kind of tenacity to, 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 to first of all, to get the Brabham name and then to go and find the funding to build a road car. You've now got the road car. To get all of that done, not, you know, you can't underestimate that. And that's probably come, a lot of that has come from your racing, the fact of pushing yourself and finding opportunities. Because a lot of people could sit there and just say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a Brabham, you know, people should be paying me for the name. And it doesn't work like that, does it? You've got to go out there and you've got to make it happen. No, you, can, you do. You've got, to, you, you've got to make it happen. You've, you've got to make it work. And as you said, the skill sets that you learn as a driver, um, and it definitely helps. There's no doubt about it. And yeah, I didn't run a business for 25 years before I did this. You know, yeah. I, ran, I ran David Brabham as a racing driver. Yeah, yeah. I was always a paid professional. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, stepping out in the real world is is, is a far bigger challenge than I ever imagined. And, uh, and also, you're 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 on that adrenaline and junkie rush for so long. Yeah. And then step off that. You get. You, I found myself getting very low. Yes. Because I I wasn't filling up that a void of well, there was a void, but I just wasn't getting that adrenaline rush that I was I was so used to and so hooked on. Didn't yeah. realize I was so hooked on it till I left it. And do you find now that do you find it now that now that you actually get some traction with with what you're doing that you know it's it's starting to you get a, a, an excitement or a buzz in a different way. You know to see you know, to see the car out there in production to see it on the track. Do you do you get a buzz from from that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you get a buzz. I think it is. A, I think there's a slightly different buzz to competition. Mm. where you're up against someone else it's against the lap time which we've yeah. had all our lives yeah. this is a bit different there's still competition because you know it, it, it's it's a challenge to to one start up something like this yeah. but, but but obviously to to make it sustainable and, and and adapt as things move and obviously COVID has thrown a huge wobble to a lot of the the big motor manufacturers yeah i mean yeah absolutely yeah um we're, we're lucky in our in our world of brand automotive because we're you know we're a lot smaller we're a lot nimbler um it hasn't affected us like it has say the big boys you yeah. Know. yeah yeah so uh, one of the other questions we had was along the same line john took will ask that one john asked some great questions each time guy um i can't remember who asked this one so forgive me but this was what do you drive on the road this was on instagram i think this question that's that's funny because my dad, everybody would say to me with my dad because they all knew him in Australia, even though they didn't know him, but they knew knew him on TV, and he was this famous racing driver. They'd always say, "Well, what, what's, what's your dad drive? What's your dad drive? You know, is he is he got a Ferrari? He's got a Lamborghini? You know, what's he got?" It's like, no, dad just has a Ford Falcon. You know, it's just a four door saloon, yeah. um, and and that's what I grew up with. And so cars were not a big thing in our family, which is kind of weird. Racing was and yeah. driving, but, but cars weren't. It wasn't until I got older that I started to appreciate cars more, particularly the classics, yeah. the, old, the old cars, yeah. uh, which I love and adore now. But back then, didn't really think about it. Didn't really think about it. So I, I, I just drive around in a BMW 5 Series. I mean, I just get from A to B, do my thing. What model? That's crucial. Fuck. Five five twenty diesel. Oh really? And, and and you do because I think there's drivers. People always say the same thing to me, and I'm like, you know, I'm not really into cars. Hang on, guy. Hang on. Should we talk about your BMW? <laughs> well, my, my That's my pretty four. special. No, yeah, your but, M4. but yeah, but my my point being is I'm not really I'm not really I'm not really into cars. I'd be quite happy. I'd drive anything to be fair. Because actually, because it's the driving. You you love driving, but you driving, it, it? it doesn't matter what you are. Because in racing, you drive whatever you can. You'll be like me. What I enjoy most, what I enjoy, well, not, I mean, what I, I really enjoy doing. I love going to Paul Ricard, getting some Renault Clear hire car, manual gearbox, and then giving it a good old thrashing for a couple of yeah. weeks. Because it's a manual, and you get in a manual, and it's like, God, this is great. It's got no power, so you just cane it everywhere. And actually, you get as much fun as you do driving a I mean, Porsche or whatever. So, 
<laughs> if you do I drive the hire car around Le Mans next week, if you could do an in-car lap for us, that would be Actually, I've, I've, got, I've, got a, I've got a flying spare. I'm, I'm actually going to drive over and I'm hey. driving over in a flying spare. Are you really? I've been driving, I've been driving around like a, like a chauffeur for the last couple of days. So Someone did a track, a track day at Alton Park today in a, a new Rolls Royce. Really? And uh, did their, um, the odds test in it as well. Oh, nice. Very nice. nice. So, Paul, should we, should we get on with some quick fire questions for David? I think we should. Can you remember the pass along guy? It seems a long time. I made, I made a note of the pass along from Ben. Um, so I've got that. So we're, we're all good. So David has got a couple of questions, quick fire questions for you. So just first thing that comes into your mind on those. And then uh, we've got a pass along question from, uh, from Ben for you. So um, are, you, are you ready? Mm -hmm. So uh, Top Gear or Grand Tour? Top Gear. Le Mans or Formula One? Le Mans. Beach holiday or adventure holiday? Adventure. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Oversteer or understeer? Whatever's quickest. <laughs> <laughs> Panos, or, Panos or Peugeot? Uh, Peugeot. <laughs> V6 or V8? Huh? V6 or V8? V8. V8. That's All what's right. in the Brabham BT62. <laughs> Actually, what manufacturer is it a Ford? A, it's a Brabham V8. It's, it's a 5.4 litre. Because the, or, um, the origins of it are very mysterious, aren't they? Uh, not really, no. I mean, yes, it is off a forward block, but yeah. Yeah, we modified it enough. Uh, we went from 5.2 to 5.4 and we lightened it. Made Which, yeah, money. most manufacturers now don't on low volume cars, do they? They just stick an engine in. Even yeah, we just, we just wanted something a bit more bespoke. Um, for what we wanted to achieve and of course when we when we started that program it, it was to build the ultimate trap car mm. and, and a car that would go on a racetrack and break records and and the goal was to to beat the, the record at bathurst uh which we did um as well as phillip island um queensland raceway and the bend you know everywhere we went in australia we we broke records so we I achieved we achieved we achieved our goals you know it's and the reason that's that fast is because you know it's got 700 horsepower it's got 1200 kilos of downforce at, at 167 mile an hour and it's got um a uh, abs traction control carbon carbon brakes and it's 972 kilograms dry weight wow wow and then just moving on from that to the, the important one guy dogs again Oh yeah, yeah, dogs, yeah, yeah. We're just saying, David. Every everybody, every racing driver said dogs over cats so far. So Ryan right. Gush said cats, but he's an engineer, not a racing driver. Yeah, so. it's, it's an interesting theme. So it's always an interesting question now when that comes up. Racing drivers like loyalty, don't they? That's what it is. So if you if you if you if you Maybe. like cats and racing driver, you ain't gonna make it. So <laughs> I think we should. Well, when, I, when I was in Formula One in 1990, uh, we had cats. We had two cats. Did you really? Yeah, we had two cats. Scruffy and Charlie, and, and then uh, British Blue. How did Formula, Formula One didn't go that well for you when you had cats? Now you've got dogs, presumably. And yeah, I'm not sure if I blame the cats, but um, <laughs> <laughs> they, well, you uh, know that, David, you just don't know that. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe. But I'll... since, but since then, yeah, dogs. Yeah, I never thought I'd be <laughs> suggesting I had dogs David on the Brabham farm. That, never, never thought I'd be suggesting to David Brabham that his cats may have been the reason for Formula yeah. One not really taking off. Yeah. yeah, no, I don't think we could use that one. So <laughs> I've got a pass along question from Ben Collins, and it's um, really what Star Wars character would you be if you had to be it for the rest of your life? <laughs> <laughs> Chewbacca. Chewbacca. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to, I said Princess Leia, but um, you know. That's Did you? Well, no, that's what you said. You said it'd be Princess Leia. I said it'd be Jabba the Hutt, but um, that's that's uh, that's what it is. So, so David, do you have one for our next guest? Have you a question that it can be anything? Oh God, you're putting me on the spot. It, it could be anything. It could be like, what's your favourite dinner? Or um, no, no, it's got to be J go, go you know go along Jason Plato's lines. Go risque. Oh God, did you you have heard? You probably won't have heard the Jason Plato episode, but um, it was um, the question was. Um, and it was Brian, time, Gush. What car? Brian Gush was the next guest. And it was like, who, what, what was the car? What, what was it? Uh, what, what was the car? The who, what was the, who was the girl? Yeah. And who was the girl that you had your first bit of action in? <laughs> <laughs> That's so <laughs> And it was Brian so Gush. 
And Brian's Gosh. like, there's something, there's something. And luckily it was my wife, Ginny. So I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then oh. Abby's, Abby's was, um, can you remember what Abby's Eaton's was? Do you like to fight one ducks, uh, one horse sized duck or 10 duck sized horses? Abby was at Cadwell Park this week. I reminded her of that. Yeah. It was like, I was like, what, what? That, so, um, but it can be, it can be, it can be anything. It's just, just for our next guest. Oh God! <laughs> don't know. Don't know. You put me on the spot, mate. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't, why don't you text me it? Why don't you? Text yeah, me I'll, I'll, I'll give me time to think of it. As you say, I'm a bit of a thinker. I like to you think have, about you, it. You, you have a think about it, and um, and then text me it, and we'll I'll I'll put it to um our next guest, who was probably going to be a off road off roader. Is that what you call him an off roader? A British rally champion. Two time, no less. Yeah, okay. So it's going to be Matt Edwards, who's a British rally champion. Um, and hopefully we're going to try and record that next week while I'm at Le Mans. Internet, internet connection, because I'm staying in a chateau in the middle of France. Right. So um, whether the connect, internet connection is going to be any good, I don't know. So we'll you see. You could probably sit in your flying spur. You've probably got a good, decent internet connection in that's, that, haven't you? That's true. It's got decent massage seats, to be fair. So a bit comfy place. Yeah. So, it would make a different backdrop, wouldn't it, if you were sat in a flying spur? I think Bentley would like it too. It would, it would. So... Um, so, yeah, so, so thanks, David. That's been awesome. It's been really, as I said uh, earlier on in the podcast, you know, I've learned a lot actually reading up on you. And, um, you know, I've got huge respect for, for what, you've, what you've achieved and actually what you are still achieving, obviously, with the, with the road car program, because, you know, I know how difficult that is. And, and uh, you know, you are smashing it. And, uh, you know, look forward to seeing how that uh, next chapter progresses. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll catch up, but we always tend to catch up at various events, uh, you know, whether it be Goodwood or, or wherever. And uh, are you at Goodwood? Co- are you at Goodwood coming up or Speed, um, speed Week? Yeah, yeah. So I'm yeah, basically I'll... Lotus Cortina with my, with my old man. Uh, oh, brilliant! Which is good. And uh, so, well, yeah. I'll be there, but I have no idea what I'm driving. Well, hopefully, I will catch up with you over a few beers and not in the catch fencing. And yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, as I say, best of luck, and thank you for coming on the the podcast. Yeah, best good, good, you, luck, good, good, good luck, luck everyone. Well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks both. Great right, stories right, once guys. again on spinning wheels. Thank you.